This is the Bartholomew Town Podcast. Hey everybody, welcome into another edition of the Bartholomew Town Podcast. It's Bill Bartholomew here with you. And today an interesting discussion with Kathleen Pletcher, who is the executive director of First Works. First Works is a nonprofit based in Providence who describe themselves as having a purpose to build the cultural, educational, and economic vitality of its community by engaging diverse audiences with world-class performing arts and education programs. They've been around since 2004. A lot of people know them because they are the, the producer of PVD Fest, as well as many other cool things that happen here in Rhode Island. And boy, this was a fun conversation because we talk about some of the upcoming programming that First Works is presenting here in Rhode Island, but we get into some really cool esoterical conversations about the role that the arts plays in our lives, what we learned from the pandemic about what that role is and and the critical nature of the arts in terms of education. So good stuff here, uh, welcoming Kathleen back to the podcast. And it's funny because the last time Kathleen was on was in 2019 as we were previewing PVD Fest 2019, which included kind of an elaborate performance um, slash live podcast thing that I did on one of the big stages. And just to think about that time and how much has changed for all of us, but specifically in the context of the arts, a lot of it for the better. Of course, there are highly negative things that have occurred during the pandemic. I know a lot of artists here in Rhode Island who struggle to continue, even though they had found a way to sustain as a full-time artist or close to full-time artist here, be it in Providence, Newport, whatever. And then the pandemic, that shift away from having the opportunity to perform live and and that shift relegated many people to having to pivot what they do to make money, frankly. Um, So there are negative things that came out of the pandemic, but we discuss some of the silver linings, and some of the reevaluation that I think is something we needed to do anyway as a culture and as a society. And really, you know, it's it's funny because as a content creator myself, which I'm almost loath to use that term because it's, I don't know, it just sounds more corporate at this point than artistic, right? But I make content, you know, I make podcasts, I make music, I make TV, radio, social media stuff, you know, cook food and put it up on Twitter every now and then, (laughs) but it's, it's it's just different, you know what I mean? And, and, And in many ways, it opens up the door for everybody to express their creativity in a meaningful way and have the opportunity to connect with an audience. And that is something that's just fantastic. There's no doubt about it. But there's also, you know, it's important to recognize and embrace art for art's sake, and have no other underlying purpose. There's no marketing element. There's no branding element. There's no, you know, um, overly thought out community engagement element. It's just art for art's sake. That's something that, that as a, as a species, I think we're ready to get back to. And the storytelling that comes with it, the aftershock of a great performance or a great installation, All of those things are critical, and I'm not saying they're lost. They certainly happen every single day, but just kind of reimagining and retweaking our focus inside schools, inside our day-to-day lives is something that from this conversation with with Kathleen is is clearly on the minds of First Works, and and it's exciting. So I hope that you enjoy this podcast. I know I did, and I look forward to having Kathleen back on later in the year as we approach PVD Fest and, and what that means and, and what that will shape up as. Um, folks, if you want to support the independent journalism, opinion, entertainment, and analysis that B-Town has become known for, well, there's a few ways you can do so. Just give a rating and review and go ahead and follow the podcast wherever you're listening right now. If that's on Apple or wherever you like to get pods. And if you want to go a step further for $3 per month, you may become a B-Town Insider. Simply visit patreon.com slash Town or click the support link wherever you're listening right now. And by the way, for daily content on all things Rhode Island and beyond, follow me on social media, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, even LinkedIn. Just search for me, Bill Bartholomew. All right, so we were just talking offline about something that it's so interesting. And if, if you don't mind sharing that Dr. Ja anecdote again of, of 
the most yes, important sure, thing sure. that that we can kind of learn from or grow or need, if you will, from the pandemic and, and how that ties into the arts. Because I think it's like the greatest launching pad for any discussion on arts in Rhode Island or anywhere. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, with the the devastation of careers and the figuring out live and online and surges and all that artists, but also first works as a, a producer presenter uh, is, is, is looking really intently at, you know, what is the really vital role the arts can play? So, um, being part of a group that had Dr. Ja speaking, uh, about, yeah, or earlier in the month, he said that the most critical thing he felt was the mental health of children. And because First Works has really invested a lot in expanding our education and, and seeing, seeing how, how that part of our work is important, it just was like a, a kind of a mind-opening thing to say, right, you know, yes, arts in integrated learning and academic success, but but we are even for children. And, and then that expanded to say, you know, um, children who are healthier have mothers who are healthier. So, you know, now we're talking about families. And I found that really interesting as somebody who is so committed in an organization now, First Works is 18 years old, um, to saying, how do the arts, how do we enrich lives through the performing arts? You know, mm -hmm. what are essential needs um, that are, are gathering and healthy families and healing and um, and learning and, and, you know, really embracing each other that the arts um, can play that role. So for Dr. Ja to name that as number one, um, it, it surprised me. I mean, he's very eloquent in my opinion, and I expected, I think what public health is, I expected something different. And I see that in the hands of, of um, the experts and artists of public health, you know, that in fact, there's a, a bigger definition. And it's one that I think the arts has a fundamental role to play in. Yeah, I completely agree. It's 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 reimagining or perhaps even returning to the original purpose of the arts, the performing arts, the visual arts back when it was a means of communication and storytelling to formulate an identity and a place in the universe that, you know, now some it, it's gotten reduced in some ways to just oh yeah, we got to make content. We got to make content. And content is generally speaking very I don't want to say it, 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 it's it's uh, it's fast food of art, but it kind of is. It kind of just comes and goes and the next day you forget about it. Whereas, you know, art as a as an instrument for a, a broad awakening and for uh, tying communities together is something that we might come out of the pandemic and say, oh, yeah, that's what it's for. This is our moment. You know, this is and of course that keeps me going. But um, sure. I think one thing you just said is you, you said return to, but then you said return to the, or, the original, you know, the, the, the core, core need for the arts, because there is um, such a sense that, that, that we're taking in that we're not trying to return to who we were in 2019. Yes. Um, ben Cameron, who is um, now head of the Jerome Foundation, but has been, um, which funds artists in New York and Minnesota, but at the NEA and instrumental in Doris Duke and some of their um, program expansion in the arts, talked um, in January about, you know, we're not returning, we're reinventing. Um, and how many of us in terms of, of especially performing arts organizations, um, you know, just go, oh, 20, 18, 19, you know, those were the halcyon days. You yes. know, I think the, the, the opportunity 
to to um, move forward in a different way. You know, we're changed forever. It's yeah. been two years. I completely agree, and and well, and it's not full virtual. Some people will imagine maybe briefly that it would be, oh, well, now we're full virtual. We're going to have all these living room concerts that are going to be somebody appearing on Facebook from their from their living room, and then we'll be able to kind of just be satisfied with that. That might be a part of it, but it's it's actually the the idea of live and in person and then e- not even necessarily the performance itself but the generative aspect of that so a performance takes place uh or an, a piece of art is installed or whatever it may be a conversation is had and then that generates through word of mouth and through the changed experience of the person who saw it firsthand and then the changed experience of the person who didn't see it and feels like they're missing out and now they need to fulfill that void in their life by seeing a, that that art ha- take place. I think more than ever, we're in a place where live, in person, interactive performing arts is is going to be like in like the 1800s when no PA system, just beautiful theaters and a performer of a no, whether it's in theater or anything. And it's kind of an exciting moment that we've mm. a, a, a silver lining of the pandemic, if you will. Yeah, I'm really interested in. Um non-traditional spaces always have been how do you take a storefront and you know uh make sure the live electric wires aren't hitting water but you know it becomes a performance space so um first works uh has a partnership for a kind of long arc project that was started with a month of video installations at water fire arts center and then uh, a group of artists around the work of daniel bernard remain haitian um, American composer, thought leader, and our artistic ambassador at First Works um, are coming together. The videos were the seeing. It's it's really a kind of witnessing of uh, and remembering, um, and the culminating performance piece with Community Music Works and Shura Barishnikov and guest artists and Daniel at Waterfire is called the Telling and. The centerpiece of that is is a composition he created around the the murder of Philando Castile. So it's a long arc of both thinking and and media, the film media, um, and um, it started really with a piece we did when PVD Fest went virtual or went dark in 2019. It was a commission work called Requiem for the Living in Color. And it was, you know, it was all so new. And Carlos Toro and Daniel, you know, kind of went into the studio for days and released Requiem for the Living. And in in those times, it had over a thousand viewers instantly, over 5,000 in a matter of days. Um, And was the centerpiece of the Waterfire exhibition. So I think there is a both what we had to do and of course in 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 your you know your work your voice i think there's a way that that the live is essential more vital than ever but it is enhanced by the opportunity to then have a conversation about it or before have a conversation or interact um with students um and which is the first works education program, you know, so so the live is part of a widening the circle. It's part of a whole array of things that um, I love live performance. I love that moment when everything else, uh, you know, has happened and I'm in a theater and I have that aura space. I'm just like, yes, but I think the everything else is is essential um that it's not just a let's put on a show you know yes one and done um but how do you widen the circle i i think a lot about live performance in the center of a circle of activities and community and absolutely and and it was it's been about 10 years now but the 360 degree model was something that i think it was you two that signed the first 360 deal, as it was called. I think Live Nation was was the person signing this. But what that was was more in the business context of, okay, well, 
the performance is one thing, but so too is your, your the, the the rights to your the your residuals in digital sales and physical sales. So so too is your brand and the merchandise. So too is every aspect of the business. <clears throat> now we're at a point where forget about the business, the performance itself and everything surrounding it. As you said, that's the 360 degree experience that people are starting to look for in, in terms of, yes, there's the performance itself, but all the residual things around it, the, the, the conversations, whether it's on podcasts or television, whatever it may be. And then the, just the, the re lived experience through social media, whatever it may be, it's all it's all part of the performance now. And that's something that I think a lot of musicians learned during the pandemic, which is you can get, you can reach more people through a single live performance. If you embrace that full 360 shared experience, then maybe through an entire tour of the United States, all of those performances combined. If you just do the live, if you just focus on this is the show, that's it. We're doing it. See you later. Yeah. It's it's a new world, new frontier. It's very exciting. Well, ab- absolutely. All right, while we're talking live performing arts, I want to let you know about a show coming up on Friday, February 18th right here in Providence at dusk. B-Town presents me, Bill Bartholomew, along with Analog, a tremendous indie rock band from Newport and Block Island as well as The Amphibious Man, a really cool indie folk project with roots in Block Island and Providence. That's Friday, February 18th at dusk in Providence, Rhode Island, right off of Harris Avenue. Uh, Doors at 8 p.m. Show starts uh, shortly thereafter. Love to see you there. Of course, we'll have all the COVID-compliant business happening. You know where I stand on all that stuff. And dusk is a wonderful venue. Look forward to that show. B-Town presents live music February 18th, a Friday night, right here in Providence. Now back to B-Town. First work started like <laughs> on, uh, you know, just, just the turn of a screw or whatever um, yeah. in March, 2020, a virtual learning series, just kind of going, oh, uh, you know, a, a gasp to, for vitality and providing teachers and students um, services and, and the network of artists we have both local and across the world. And as a result, 20,000 Rhode Island students have engaged with virtual learning. Um, we have come back to live as well and come back to, to you know, live uh, online, both. But that virtual learning series is something that is is evergreen. And um, this month we're re-releasing uh, a video that we filmed in the summer of 2020 with CD Maiga, you know, superb uh, drummer f- from Mali, but but longtime Providence uh, resident and um, his countrywoman, Umu Sangare. And we filmed this water fire and it was just, it was both elating and terrifying because it was, you know, just like what is safe and are you wiping down mics? And it's a a beautiful concert that then uh, they worked into um, an educational um, uh, virtual learning series for First Works. So I know this is Black History Month in February. It's um, being re-released as one of like 18 or uh, virtual learning that we have and we're building from there. But I think the interesting thing to go back to what you were saying is both the the reach that is possible. Um, CD is also performing in Newport schools and one of First Works artists edu- educators in the spring. Um, and that will be amazing, but, you know, 400 students, you know, that is a big, big deal, but 20,000, you know, across the state. Um, yeah, that, that was really interesting to see. And, um, I think the other thing that you said that, that, um, sparked for me is the 360 business model and, and then where we started 
kind of a meaning of life. You know, why do you do this? So, so business is a necessity, you know, sure. uh, oh, yeah. we don't want to just fall on our swords. I mean, we're a nonprofit, so we're, we're not, we're not into making money, yeah. but, um, but being sustainable um, means that, that, that needs to be part of the equation and all the, the contracts around content and um, uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of different aspects to that. There really are. It's, it's, it's a whole, that area is not in and of itself, a whole world to spend. You could spend a lifetime in that zone and people do, whether as attorneys or otherwise managers or agents or even artists themselves spending a tremendous amount of time on that. And and it's important. Um, what, well, You've got some really interesting upcoming performances and engagements, initiatives, things like that. I guess speak to some of those if you don't mind, because they're yeah, really well, exciting. Of course, of course, I'd love to, and it keeps us it keeps us going, right? But um, I think in terms of big live performance, we're really excited about um, the Blind Boys of Alabama and Amadou and Mariam coming together. Um, Amadou and Mariam have been on my workout playlist for years and years. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I, I love that that they have forged this synergy. The concert at the Vets at the end of April, um, part of First Works series, is called From Bamako to Birmingham. And, um, you know, they're both legends. We have the Gospel Hall of Famers, the Blind Boys of Alabama, and Amadou and Mariam, who are our putting Malian and American um, uh, music together. And uh, each of them are, uh, Blind Boys are five-time Grammy winners. And I love the 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 kind of um, crossing that intersection um, and that it takes nearly a day to travel between their two homes. And yeah, sure. so they are coming together this spring for that tour. And it's also part of our education program. I mean, I think their music is marvelous. We also have a first for all, meaning, um, you know, differently abled students. So all of these musicians are blind and wow. they are both on both groups and they have, you know, record breaking, you know, kind of uh, performing careers. Um, so that's a, a big thing that is coming yet this spring. Um, also, Angelique Kijo, we have a long relationship with Angelique, um, you know, global pop star, humanitarian. Her humanitarian work and the way we were just talking about is, is an aspect of who she is that I think Time Magazine called her one of the mo hundred most influential people in the world just this past year. Wow. Um, so she is engaging students uh, with First Works Education um, on conversations about two of our core themes. Um, one is Earth First around environmental awareness. And Angelique um, uh, created a uh, well, her her album is called Mother Nature, but a piece with Sting that is just so great and really, you know, video music, um, but environmental justice. And it's been a long concern of hers, um, women's rights, environmental justice. Uh, we're really looking at this, the idea of relationships with artists that that continue, they come to know Rhode Island, they come to know our students and they return and incubate new work here, collaborate with local performers. Um, we've seen that a lot in Daniel Bernard Romain, um, who uh, in January, not only the, the Water, Water Fire Arts Center based videos and collaborations and the piece that will be performed at the end of September to open our, our season. But um, he was at Noel Leadership Academy, um, and that is part of Dorcas International, um, a high school, a uh, large population of unwed mothers, fathers, teenagers. And he'd been there before and had some of the same students. And what happens in those workshops is really 
a life storytelling exchange mm. that is just beautiful. And one of the students was on Zoom. This was otherwise live. Um, and she had had her baby. And so he sang to the baby. It, and, you know, I just think those crossing platforms, you know, we're not just in our Zoom square. We We are reaching to each other. We're telling our stories. And, and for Daniel, that story is through his music as a composer and a, a violin that that he uses in about nine different ways, from classically trained to, you know, DJ to it's a percussive instrument, um, you know, all in, in the breath of uh, a few moments. So there is a lot going on till we hit the summer. And, you know, I'd, I'd love to come back and talk to you about PVD Fest and yeah. what, what we're doing in Roger Williams Park. But but it feels like these next four months or spring, this, this next season, um, education is, and reaching students and not having it be sort of an add-on, like an artist comes and here's a workshop, you know? so. Um, People can, teachers, students, uh, families can join in these things. Um, the Blind Boys and Amadou and Mariam will have an open rehearsal. We'll have workshops and conversations, just as we were talking about, right? That's that's the model. We have a graphic and some annual report of this widening the circle thing that has lots of bubbles around a central oh, bubble. I, I love it. I love those kinds of, I, I my wall is filled with those types of models that you just start to think about. All right, what if when you add this piece, this piece, focus here and reach as many different people as possible from an initial spark of an idea. So that's. Yeah. It's nice to see it visualized, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you're not just going, yeah, it's this way. But um, I think the other thing is partnership has been since the beginning of first work. So that's 2004 department of art, culture and tourism, you know, started as a turnaround from first night Providence. Um, But, but the partnerships with core schools that, that we have um, Tapa Trinity Academy of arts, the ongoing partnership with the city, the partnership with Brown, um, the partnership actually with the Taiwanese cultural council. And um, there is a um, amazing um, Taiwanese artist, Vincent Shu who was part of our virtual stage, but is also doing workshops for students in Pawtucket and JMW, where we have a a long relationship that dates back to when we first brought Wynton Marcellus and Jazz at Lincoln Center. So I feel those, those through lines and only possible I, I think this is maybe more on the business side, but only possible through partnership. In the past year, that's included um, our e-commerce. And I started with the Tech Assist, but uh, they uh, contracted us to create an urban carnivale that involved many, many artists locally, plus uh, um, Black Violin, plus Wynton Marsalis, you know, plus uh, Fidel Nadal, uh, who's Argentinian, and uh, uh uh, Natal, who is based many places, but also Providence. Sure. Um, yes. So that's a, a smattering. I think that, you know, the big performances uh, are certainly um, Bamako to Birmingham, the Blind Boys of Alabama. And um, uh, that that is kind of the giant. And, and through the summer and then the fall, starting with the telling and Daniel Bernard Romain. I look forward to talking about those down the line. Um, that flew by. We have time for one more question. Um, that's the one thing about the or, it, the podcast situ, I guess format. You know, you can go in down the rabbit hole, and usually I like those rabbit holes a lot more than just like the straight ahead talking points. So I really enjoyed this conversation. I like our you know, the rabbit holes too. I remember yeah. the last time we <laughs> talked, and I was like, "Oh, this this gets so juicy." And right. Right. Um, much more spontaneous. Absolutely. Um, um, interestingly enough, just yesterday, I saw a press release from the Rhode Island Music Educators Association that they want to make arts 
a requirement for graduation in Rhode Island. It's hard to imagine this actually passing. It's it seems like when we're talking about um, just the realities of where schools are at coming out of the pandemic and distance learning, there's enough challenges that um, it, it, I'm not sure it will happen this year. But it does seem fundamentally, as you had mentioned, ta- taking the arts and making it less of like, all right, here's an assembly, here's a departure from the ordinary, and and really embracing that STEAM mentality, the, the science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And yeah. it's been lost. There's no question about it. You know, friends of mine that teach all around the state will tell you, especially those who are artists themselves, this is a major issue and that that it's it's not just about the cultural intake, but it's also about the way that you can program your brain through arts um, that is critical. Obviously, you're doing tremendous work inside in, in an educational context, but but based on what you've learned from doing that work through these workshops and the educational portion of your your operation, be it virtual, in-person, or hybrid, what's something just for educators out there to think about in the back of their mind of how they can introduce compelling arts to students, even in science, math, yeah. non-traditional arts type environments? How, how can that, how can we do that? Exactly, they can. Yeah. I mean, you can put it under the, the heading of arts integrated learning. But I, I think that that is, is where the vitality lies. I mean, so I know we only have a, a, a minute or so, but I, I think that's where transformation lies. And a couple things for educators to think about are, um, you know, from the point of view of first works are the virtual learning series, which address science or address history. Um, also professional development. We started a professional development series with, with ride um, a year and a half ago, which is continuing to have thematic, whether it's racial equity or whether it's climate change and the arts. So I think, I think where those intersect to use that word again, I go way back to um, Yo-Yo Ma and the Silk Road in 2008. We were pretty small, but we, we stepped up and, and did a year long project um, thanks to Yo-Yo's generosity and a culminating performance at PPAC. But the Silk Road was all about a curriculum that took you through history and conflict. And um, this is what, you know, so Stanford University had created this and, you know, um, a mega project, right? A mega artist with Yo-Yo Ma and, and his collaborators. But this is what we're after, that um, we're definitely about world class, whether it's, you know, around the corner or from across the globe, but also what the arts are saying to us. An animator like Miwa Matreak is talking about climate change and a science teacher can use that video lesson or performance and study guide, um, use our earth first curriculum. Um, so I, I think artists themselves are not, uh, most of the ones I know and love are, are, are people who are sparking off a lot of ideas. And um, Bill T. Jones, the uh, American choreographer who we're doing, about to unveil a big project with, inspired by Moby Dick and, um, you know, MLK and just bringing a lot of different things together about literature, not just dance. You know, yeah. so that 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 um, arts for art's sake, I I want to erase that in a way because I think teachers who are able to vitalize their classroom. Uh, we did a year long project with Jazz at Lincoln Center, saying jazz and math. You know and democracy. Um, you know, those were two different themes. Our themes now are raise your voice uh, about celebrating difference and creating equity and empowering voices and earth first. And these with, with our um, education department are being built across the year. So teachers of different subjects 
than just the arts, only the arts, <laughs> um, beyond the arts. That's a much better way to put it. Um, can engage and and you know vitalize their classroom and and their students. Student retention was something that Ride talked to us about. You know, at the very beginning, it suddenly made the arts much more important. Yes, I believe it completely. And and yeah, I know just personal experience that I've had in in my high school, even middle school education. You know, when you when I when the when the switch was flipped from standard issue to creative take being able to take creative license, that engagement rate, at least for me and for a lot of the people I was around, also went through the roof and the retention and effort went through the roof. And just by organically embracing the arts, that's and that's that that's something that that when we when we talk about bringing arts to people, there are existing forums that it can be done in. And the first one, of course, is is definitely inside schools. So and of course, you're already doing that on a regular basis. So, <laughs> yeah, I think the government, you know, has through the pandemic in 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 supporting the sector, also helping the sector survive, uh, started to create new possibilities. Mm-hmm. How that continues, where things go with ARPA and, and all of that is is a question, but that's another, you know, seize the moment. Definitely. Kind of thing for the arts, for first works, for everybody. Yeah. Rhode Island's podcast of record, B-Town. At HealthSource RI for Employers, we provide access to health insurance to more than 1,100 local businesses and nonprofits, and 96% of them renew through us every year. Maybe it's our choice of 19 different health plans, our 10 years of customizing solutions, or our one local team of dedicated experts helping employers find quality health insurance. See how our numbers stack up for you. Learn more at healthsourceri.com/employers.